Okay, welcome everybody to this conference on how to protect the biotope of your windmill. My name is Nicole Bakker and I welcome you on behalf of the steering group of the Craft of the Miller Network. Today we will talk about the biotope. And everybody knows here a windmill needs wind to work and produce. But many mills, however, find the access to wind restricted by trees or other obstructions. Or they are potentially restricted by plans to create new buildings close to the mill. On our workshop today, we will cover the following topics. What is a wind biotope and what are the risks or the challenges? Um, an explanation of the wind biotope model, which we developed in the Netherlands, and Agnes de Boer is going to talk about that. And we have a study to validate and update the windmill biotope model from Steve Temple from the UK. After the two videos uh, with their presentations, we divide into four groups to discuss more about the challenges we have. And I'll explain more about the, the groups later on and how you get into a room uh, and which topic is discussed in there. But now um, I will start the video with Agnes de Boer. Dear listeners and mill lovers, I'm pleased to tell you more about the mill biotope in the Netherlands, especially about the working of the mill biotope formula as a planning instrument of local government. The subjects in my presentation are a brief history of the mill biotope, why is the formula developed, what are the calculation principles of the formula, how does it work and what does it predict, how is the formula used in, planned, in planning by governments, especially local government, in which cases is the formula successful and what are the challenges the mill have to deal with in the planning system and how does that affect the loss of the wind rows. Why was a mill biotope formula developed? The essential aim of the formula is that the functioning of a windmill requires a flow, a free flow of wind to the mill, and also a good quality of the wind without turbulences. It's just the same for the water mill. That requires a good supply and drainage of water, but that's less easy to capture in a formula. So we now only talk about windmills. In the competition for space between, for example, living, working, recreation and protection of heritage, rules are necessary. A mill biotope formula helps to make those rules clear and uniform. But where does the formula come from? A brief history. In the 15th century, wind and wear right arose as a feudal rights of a landlord. Mills were necessary for the economic security of existence, for example, grinding corn, sowing trees and striking oil. In the Netherlands, those rights ended with the constitution of 1798. The Hollandse Molen, our organization, was founded in 1923. We had different individual successes in the 30s, 40s and 50s with protecting the environment of windmill by local government. And also, uh, mostly higher governments were willing to take account of the mills, by example, planting smaller trees uh, along roads. The real start of the formula was in 1973. After the Guild of Volunteer Millers was founded in 1972, there came more millers, and so more attention for mills and their biotope. The Mill Biotope Working Group, existing of scientists, consultants, and employees of higher government, developed the mill biotope formula in 1982. The guild founded a biotope card with millers who keep their eyes and ears open and fought for the protection of the biotope. The first principles of a formula. At first, water bounds and local governments apply the 1-200 rule. It's a simple and effective rule to predict the height of an obstacle on a certain distance of the mill. Because of the already presence of other obstacles like houses, firms and trees, there came an alternative in cities and villages, the 1 to 30 rule. This rule is still used in parts of the Netherlands. Sometimes there's also a 1 to 50 rule. 
it's most likely a misfit of the n is 50 norm of our formula i will talk about later um, but fortunately it's not a bad alternative because the one of 50 is stricter than the one to 30. Then the principles of the mill biotope formula of the Hollandse Molen, which is used in uh, great parts of the Netherlands. The aim of the mill biotope formula is to minim minimize the loss of wind and therefore the loss of power of windmills and to prevent wind turbulences. The mill biotope formula predicts the height of an obstacle at a certain distance of the windmill. At first, to prevent turbulences, the first 100 meters around the mill must be completely free of buildings and trees. By higher mills, the buildings and trees in this area must stay under the height of the balcony or mound. Between 100 and 400 meters uh, counts the mill biotope formula. The starting of the formula is a maximum loss of wind of 5%. That's a loss of mill power of 14%. Yeah, this is the uh, formula uh, uh, in numbers, uh, and it makes use of the next items. The distance of the obstacle to the mill. The type of area, uh, an open area like the sea or a football field. A rough area with a few trees or a single farm with products on the land like corn. And a closed area like a city or a village with other buildings and trees. Then the wind shaft height, the height of the wind shaft from the natural ground height around the mill. This is also the half of, uh, half of the length of the sail span uh, added with the height of the balcony or the mill mount. And then you can predict the height of uh, an obstacle on um, 100, 200, 300, 400 meters around the mill. How is it used today in the Netherlands? Most, but not all, of the local governments have protection rules in their plans, mostly based on the one of the one of their formulas. Also, few water bounds have protection rules, especially for polder mills, which still can pump water. Some provinces have instruction rules to force local governments to make protection rules. This year, we've got new legislation in the Netherlands, the Omgevingswet or Environmental Act. And that act forces local government to protect the surroundings of monuments to prevent damage or disfigurement. There are much difference in applied rules and there are, are also different possibility for governments to deviate from the rules. A structure of case law can help us, but also can disturb the protection as recently happened with the mill millers of the windmill at Nupke in Geldrop. They were declared inadmissible by the judge, and now millers can't stand up formally against threats of the biotope. So anyway, there are many differences in the interpretation of the regulations. And the regulations even say, does not say how to regulate the protection. An instrument which can help in the future is a mill passport. It describes the values of the mill, and it will be a good development when parties agree on the passport and so on the values. But the formula is not enough. Uh, the planning protection with the formula is a good step, but it's only the first step. The local government okay. is in charge. And as said before, they can always deviate from the rules. Sometimes they make deviation rules, like asking advice of a mill expert or investigate the effects of the plan on the mill. And there's also something like the general interest. I was too quick. So if the plan doesn't fit in the formula, governments ask a consultant to investigate the effects of the plan of the mill. We have no general rules for the investigation. So as we say in the Netherlands, who pays it, determines it. By us it sounds better, we betaald bepaald. Problems with the investigations are, for example, they are sectoral and do not take the wall of the windrows into account, so they do not take into account all the obstacles. 
But of course, the formula can be successful. Some provinces have made instruction rules with local governments have to follow. Sometimes they also have to approve deviations of the formula or the rules. As we see on the picture in Eilst, the buildings are, um, have uh, been built off in the ground. So they are below the balcony of the mill. In general, professional used mills more often get a good protection. Anyway, consultants and governments take more into account the interest of professional used windmills. There are also more successes when government, civil services and developers are known with the mill and the biotope and care about heritage. And how earlier parties talk to each other, the better it is. When there is the possibility of making adjustments to the plan, there is more chance of success than when the whole plan has to be stopped. Uh, current challenges. On this picture, also an example of uh, good buildings around uh, a mill with a balcony. The houses are only uh, two stores high. The biggest challenge in our small country is to struggle on limited space. People will live, work, play, move and enjoy nature and heritage. The environmental protection of trees is more often key priority, also because of climate, climate change. We need more uniformity in, uniformity in regulations, especially on the how of the protection. Most of the time, local government doesn't know what to protect and how to do it. We also need to integrate heritage protection into planning. Mostly taking into, into account heritage and its surroundings is not difficult but you have to want it and know how to do it. Another challenge is that we want to stop the sectoral approach of the wind rows and guarantee a maximum of 5% wind loss. How can we realize this in planning? There's also need to provide a more uniform method methodology for calculating the actual effects of an obstacle. Hopefully Stephen Temple can tell us more about this. On all levels, it's necessary to create support for the importance of windmills and of the need of free wind. Well, thank you, Agnes, on the video. That uh, was very clear. Um, I think we'll just go on with the presentation of Steve Temple uh, on the model of the UK. Uh, I've ask everybody to uh, put uh, the microphone on mute, just to be sure. And uh, then I will look for the video of Steve. And questions can be asked later for Steve and Agnes uh, when you are in the breakout rooms. I'm Steve Temple, and I have been working for some years now on the Molan biotope. Okay, I am a professional inventor and an engineer by trainer training, and I live in Cambridge and have done for since 1968. And I worked for a consultant consultancy company that employed inventors for uh, commercial purposes. I left that in 2000 and uh, helped to start up a new company based on an invention that I had made in inkjet printing. And um, 10 years later, uh, I bought Impington Windmill. I hadn't intended to buy a windmill, but my wife wanted a larger garden and a small cottage. And it came with a sort of folly stuck in the middle of it in a terribly bad condition. And I set about restoring it. And this is what it looks like today. Early on, I became involved with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings which has a statutory duty in the UK to look after windmills, amongst other things. And one of the key issues which arose uh, in the course of the work I've done for the SPAB was the Stanton Planning Appeal. This was uh, another local Cambridgeshire mill, well, sorry, not Cambridgeshire, it's Suffolk mill. It's a Suffolk post mill near to us. And it was being threatened by a planning proposal involving a large number of houses, 
just off to the left of where this picture was taken uh, and coming within 100 metres of the mill. And the owners and operators of the mill, they grind corn, uh, were very worried that uh, the wind would affect the windmill and in particular uh, run the risk of masking the fan tail, which is very low down and which is, of course, crucial to winding a mill of this sort. Uh, with a little help from us, um, the local planning officer rejected the planning proposal, but the developers took it to appeal and an inquiry was held, uh, which lasted about 10 days of a fairly strong argument, but the end result of which was that the planning inspector accepted the stories told by the de developers, wind analysts, or so-called wind analysts, and uh, allowed the planning permission to take place, uh, and it has now been built, and it does affect the wind to the windmill. I spent some time after that thinking, what could we do about it? How could we defend windmills? And after consulting with other people, we decided that what we needed was to buy an anemometry system uh, and the SBAB very kindly gave us the money to do that. And I and a friend made a magnetometer so you could measure the pointing of the mill. And we set it up at my own mill at Impington and also at John Cook's mill at Swaffham Prior. And the rest of this talk is about what we have discovered using that equipment. So let us start with the importance of the Molan biotope in planning. There is a lot of things wrong with the current practice of the way um, wind data is used by consultants uh, to prove that, it's, that a building is not going to affect a windmill. Starting with the inappropriate use of the wind roses themselves. This is a typical local wind rose. It comes from RAF Mildenhall, which is quite close to both Swaffham Prior and Impington and also Stanton. And it looks like a very normal wind rose for this country, with the predominant wind, of course, coming from the southwest. The building uh, proposal at Stanton was in the northwest quarter. And when you look at this wind rose, you would assume that that actually doesn't have much relevance to the mill because uh, the wind is relatively weak from that quarter. However, what that masks is the fact that from this direction, there are a whole lot of buildings and trees in the way of the southwesterly winds. And the consequence of that is that the wind speed has shrunk in this quarter and it makes the northwest quarter much a much more significant contributor. And that is completely ignored and always is ignored in planning inquiries, in my experience. Secondly, um, nobody has a, a way of converting a, a wind speed measurement or prediction uh, into impact on the windmill performance. And so I have been developing a way of calculating the loss of operate, operating time that arises because of a reduction in wind. And last but not least, um, all the wind consultants resort to computational fluid, fluid dynamics to calculate the effect on the windmill. It's a relatively very expensive process, uh, so they only apply it in one direction. And for example, at Stanton, they took one direction such as this with one house where actually about 50 houses were going to get built. Um, secondly, there is great uncertainty in the parameters used with computational fluid dynamics. And for any particular situation, such as a group of houses, there's almost no relevant validation. So there's no checking of which parameters to use. Contrast that with the simplicity of the Molan Biotube. It provides a calculation which allows you to work out the speed loss. Now, the way it's expressed, and Agnes uh, talked about this just now, the way it is expressed in Holland is that the maximum height of a house you're allowed, HX, is equal to this expression here. Uh, and the C in here is the, the allowable wind loss. Now, 
we're in the situation, for example, at Impington, where all the houses around the mill exceed the maximum height that would be allowed by this equation. So I turn it round and make C the subject. So the speed loss equals this expression. And this bit in brackets here, H minus X over N, actually calculates the intercept height of the wake from the house at the mill. And basically it has the effect of burying the mill into the ground by this height and thereby, of course, losing it wind speed. Now, I'm not interested in the speed loss. I'm interested in how much speed remains because that's what I use to calculate milling time. So my expression comes out as the speed factor equals one minus the intercept height over the wind shaft height. Now, that is a really simple expression and you can use it and the most important thing you can use it for is to create a windrose that is local to the wind windmill itself so you get a, a drawing like this the gray line here shows the average wind speed at RAF Milding, Milden Hall in this case uh, and then the blue line shows what the speed will be at the mill once you take into account all the speed factors around all these sectors. So all 36 10 degree sectors has its own speed factor. You multiply the speed at the reference meteorological station by the speed factor and you get the blue line. We have anemometry at Impington, which covers exactly the same full 360 degrees and gives us the black line. And it is quite clear that the black line and the blue line are extremely close to each other and they uh, are really undeniable. They are hard measurements. So we can transpose the windrows to what it really is at the mill and then we can work out what the additional loss is uh, due to another house or object. And this we present on another graph, which I call milling time. So this, the grey line now represents how many hours a year I could have ground if I had the wind as it is at um, RAF Mildenhall. The blue line calculates the currently available milling time that I have, and the black line is the anemometry equivalent of it. And you can see that this is a pretty depressing picture. The fraction of time that I can mill now is only a few percent compared to what it was in former times. But this graph is what we show the planning officers. It's a simple expression of the harm being done to the windmill. So let's understand the Molen biotope a little bit better and start with the model that lies behind that equation. This is a pictorial version of representing that equation. Here's the windmill. Uh, the wind's blowing from left to right there's an obstacle here in front of the windmill. The, the effect of the obstacle is to lift the boundary layer over its top, and then the boundary layer gradually comes back down to the ground after some distance determined by the wake decay factor, as Agnes was describing. That line, the blue line below it, the speed in the wind is zero. Actually, it's turbulent, it's coming and going, but it's a net average of zero. So you can't mill if you had a windmill in this region. Um, by the time the boundary layer proper gets to the mill, it's down at this height here where the blue line intercepts the height of the mill. So what has happened to the mill is that originally it had a boundary layer looking like this uh, mauve line, but that has now been lifted up to this height. And in order to get the same speed at the mill, you have to get a faster wind like this. And then you get the same operability at the mill. So the speed factor is the velocity of the original um, undisturbed boundary layer. Uh, and the U dash is the speed you now have to operate, or the wind has to get a blow at, in order to get the same effect at the mill. And to get the uh, oper operability, well, first and foremost, um, I want to demonstrate that the speed factor is constant uh, regardless of wind speed. So this is data taken from Impington. The blue points are scatter plot values where this axis represents what was at the MET station. 
and this axis represents the speed we actually measured at the mill uh, and you can see that the, the scattered dots are closely followed by this straight line a trend line going through the origin and having the form y that is the speed at the mill is 38 percent of x the speed at the meteorological station and the confidence the statistical confidence in how well that line is representing all that scattered data is 96 percent so this is a really good correlation this particular one is just for 180 degrees but i have a graph like this for all the sectors around the mill all 36 sectors and they all show a straight line to approximately this level of confidence so once you've established that, you can now use the statistics of a wind flow uh, to help you uh, to work out milling time. So the blue line here is a standard wind distribution. It's called a Weibull distribution, and you have to calibrate it for each direction. The black line is what we actually get uh, at Milden Hall uh, in the same direction. And you can see that the two lines are pretty close to each other. And again, they have a high confidence over 90% that the blue line represents what you actually get. The red line shows the threshold milling speed of the mill. So I know that my mill will not operate in less than about four meters per second. So basically any wind speed below four meters per second is out. I can't use it. Wind speeds above four meters a second, I can use. And if I integrate this and get the area under this plot, it tells me how many hours a year I can operate the mill. Now, that's with the speed taken at Milden Hall. But if I take the speed actually as I get it at uh, Impington, uh, it's something like this. It's uh, multiplied. I, I multiplied it by 0.6 here, which is actually about the highest speed factor I observe at Impington. But you can see what's happened. I've shrunk the wind speed axis. The times are still the same because it's the same wind blowing, just not as fast. And now, of course, the area above the red line is down to this miserable little quarter here, a tiny fraction. Of, of what was available without the obstacles in the way. So in order to get the good quality correlation that I've shown here, I've had to make some changes to the Molen biotube. Let's start with the effective height of the building. This is a set of pictures. The, the pictures on the left show a wind tunnel model with different types of buildings, different roof lines of buildings. And what you and the smoke uh, the white lines are smoke trails representing uh, visualizing the wind flow over the house. And what you can see is that indeed the boundary layer is lifted up, but it's lifted up more than the height of the house. And what I find in general, and there's a lot of measurements available to confirm this, is you can take an average of about 1.3. So you have to add about 30% to the height of the house. And I've put that in as a modification factor to the Molen biotube. The pictures to the right show computational fluid dynamics. And there are two things to note here. This series of pictures are made with one set of parameters. This set of pictures is made with another set of parameters. And you can see immediately they don't look very much like each other. And also neither of them looks very close to what we've got on the left actually happening in the wind tunnel itself. So this side of this picture shows quite clearly how difficult it is to get computational fluid dynamics to represent reality. Now, a second point is that the Molen biotube offers you three different weight decay distances, as it calls them. Uh, and the question is, which of these three values should I be using? And the answer is very simple. I should be using 50. I've tried a range of factors in my calculation, and the optimum always turns out to be 50. So we're always dealing effectively with an urban environment because that's what you get behind a large obstacle. And another point about it is that um, the Molen Biotube makes the assumption that um, the atmospheric boundary layer has a linear pr um, profile. So the orange line, where every time you double the height, you double the speed 
is what is assumed in the molar and biotope. But we know from all sorts of measurements that that is not right. Uh, it should be used uh, calculated using a logarithmic distribution as shown in this blue line. And that makes a very substantial difference to a number of aspects of, of what we're trying to calculate. So I now have built the logarithmic profile into the Molen biotope. Now trees, trees are a subject which everybody is concerned about and quite rightly so, um, because they tend to dominate, they're much higher than houses. Excuse me. <clears throat> now the thing about trees is that they have a non-zero wake. They don't bring the wind to full stop. They are porous and they allow wind through the leaves. Uh, and so I have reworked this boundary layer uh, in the presence of a porous obstacle. So now I have the porous obstacle here is eight meters high and up to eight meters, I am allowing about 60 percent of the flow to come through the tree. And then above that height, of course, it resumes its normal profile. Again, the blue line shows the logarithmic equivalent of that. As soon as, now the thing about houses is that they also tend to have porosity because you never get or very rarely get a solid block of houses right across the front of the windmill. Typically, even a terrace of houses has gaps in it and single houses, of course, have quite big gaps between them. So we should treat houses as being porous as well. Um, and in that case, you can do everything with this one model of the atmospheric boundary layer. And in particular, what you can do is to put successive obstacles in line. Uh, and you need to do that once you deal with porosity, uh, some wind gets through from one succession of houses to another or succession of trees. And so you have to be able to combine them together. And that is what I've done in this graph. So those are the things I've done to change the treatment of the molar biotope. And it is those things which give the excellent quality of comparison between the predicted values from the molar biotope and my measured values from um, obstacles, from anemometry. But there's one other thing we need to take into account, and that is there are systematic variations in the wind. And first and foremost, there's a day-night variation. This is raw data taken from Impington. Uh, and the scale along the bottom here is days. So each of these divisions is one day. And what you can see immediately is you get a peak in wind speed um, at around midday every day and a trough around midnight every night. So if we simply average these, which is what is normally done in uh, wind roses, we are really not giving the story correctly for the windmill. So I now use wind roses that are daytime only um, and ignore the nighttime values completely. Secondly, of course, if you're dealing with trees, you need to have some winter variation because of the, the deciduous trees are much more porous in winter than they are in summer. But it's also true that the wind roses themselves change from wind, winter to summer. Everybody knows that it's, it's windier in winter, but here's a demonstration of it. This is a summer wind rose, a daytime only, from RAF Mildenhall. And this, and note the, the red bits around here, they represent the highest speed wind available during the summer. If I show you the winter wind rose for the same period, you will see immediately that the wind is blowing much harder uh, around every single quarter um, during the winter. So we have to do the whole calculation for summer and winter separately and then take the total milling time to tell us what the performance is. So the validation, I've already shown you these two plots. Uh, these are the plots at Impington. Uh, and they show how well the correlation is uh, achieved between the molar biotube and measurements, and it shows you milling time. This is the same plot taken for Swaff and Fry, John Cook's mill. Um, and I'm sorry, but we didn't get data over this half, so they hence the black line across here, uh, simply because unluckily in the time we had the anemometer up there, uh, it never blew at a sensible speed uh, from this from this half of the compass. Uh, 
However, during in the other half, the the match is pretty good. In most places, it's as good as it was at Impington. But in this quarter here, there's a serious discrepancy. And I can explain that, but I can't prove my explanation. Uh, there is a road, a bypass, that passes Soft and Prior windmill at a shallow angle, and it channels the wind uh, up past the windmill. So it effectively ends up masking the windmill. And I put that in rather artificially into the Boland Pyre tube and got this red line, uh, which it gives, gives me back the good quality match that I was hoping for. But I have to say that is a bit speculative. What I really need is a bit more data. And that I'm hoping to get in the very near future uh, with the Upminster Smart Molon project. This is a very valuable project being carried out at the moment where they have installed magnetometers on 16 mills, four in Germany and the rest scattered across the UK, so that they can track how well they're winding. But uh, last week we installed one of these systems at Impington together with an anemometer. So now we can not only know which way the mill is facing, but how much wind it's getting as well. And with this equipment, we will be able to derive a new validation for the mill and we hope to install this on a good number of mills and really extend the data that we have got. So that is the end of my talk. Well, I have some appendices which we can talk about later uh, in terms of practicalities etc. Meanwhile I'll leave you with a picture of my mill just to show you what a crowded landscape it is around it and how ideal it is for doing this sort of work not so ideal for actually milling with it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and thank you, Agnes, again. Uh, that's very, two very interesting presentations, uh, but they also probably raised some questions um, uh, of clearance of stuff because it was, uh, well, quite a bit for my technical uh, <laughs> knowledge at the moment, but I see the point uh, in both uh, ones. Um, at this moment, I suggest we have a five minute break. And in the meantime, I will make uh, the uh, breakout rooms. Well, I hope that was very well, interesting was very and interesting. also uh, good to talk to everybody. Um, and I want to ask the moderators to give the main conclusions or the main learnings and key themes that you have discussed in your workshop. And I would like to start with John. John, how was it in your workshop or your, your breakout room? Well, thank you very much, Nicole. So first of all, can I just check that everyone has um, put their um, mute back on uh, just so that we don't get any feedback. So I'll share my screen and just explain uh, what we covered in our, in our breakout room. So hopefully everyone can see that now. You're quick, John. OK, so um, we discovered we just explored three uh, key examples or issues um, from members of our breakout room. Um, one uh, in the UK, where a application uh, to build 20 houses has been permitted uh, to the southwest of a post mill um, in uh, Sussex uh, in the UK. Um, the interestingly, the planning officer uh, who assessed the application um, was concerned about the visual impact of the development on the mill, um, but um, were not uh, concerned about the impact in terms of the loss of wind. This is a working mill, and um, so uh, this is, of course, of concern. Now, the discussion we recognised um, the planning application has now been granted, so these houses will be built. Always important to ensure that um, an assessment has been done to understand whether there will be actual harm. So this uh, mill sits high up. It is already on uh, a number of uh, directions surrounded by houses, but they're all much lower than the mill and certainly the rotation of the sales. So if uh, a mill owner uh, or a trust uh, is going to challenge a planning application, we must make sure that we have actual data. 
then we can challenge with authority and demonstrate the harm that is to be caused rather than we think there will be harm. There's got to be harm because these are buildings and they're close to a mill. Well, not necessarily, depending on the height of the mill to the height of the buildings, and obviously recognise, as I'm sure Steve will talk about later, the disruption to the, the boundary layer of wind. So um, key, therefore, to understand the heights of the roofs concerned, but also um, what will be ruled around the planting of trees. And although we were talking about buildings, trees also came into our discussion. So, Eric, we, we might beat, uh, beat your thunder here. Um, so... Um, this question, of course, if, and I won't say too much because I'm sure Eric will be talking about this. Uh, if a tree is to be planted, it's not only five, ten years, it's when the tree reaches its full height. But I'll leave Eric, I'm sure, to pick that up. So what agreement is possible, if any, to ensure that the tree can be managed 30, 40, 50 years hence? Second uh, example, uh, also contain trees, so I'll not say too much about this, but a, a very generous uh, government, local government department in the Netherlands decided it would be a great idea to give out free trees uh, to the community. Uh, of course, uh, in some parts of the Netherlands, as we understand it, there are rules uh, about what can be planted in the biotope area of the mill. And in this case, the local authority government had to be reminded of um, those rules. So again, something to look at. You cannot get back your biotope if it has been lost by a building or by trees. It is very difficult to tell someone to chop their tree down um, unless you are uh, a government agency. And the third example um, was looking at a development in the Netherlands where a developer is um, perhaps playing a game, um, making threats about what they would like to build as a way of trying to um, push the mill uh, and the mill trust uh, to accept their proposals. And so we recognized that it is probably going to be essential to have the kind of assessment that Steve, I'm sure, will tell us about shortly and the good news is that uh, this can be done, as I know Steve will say, without significant cost, uh, using the model and the tool that Steve is now developing. So that um, the, any proposal that comes forward can be assessed against the existing uh, state in terms of the number of hours that the mill can operate the current biotope. So those were three of the themes, Nicole, uh, that came from our discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to say any more about that if uh, any of the other group members of the group would like to. Thank you, John. Uh, well, next, uh, we do first the conclusions of the groups, and then I'll give uh, the, the floor to Steve and Agnes to say something, and maybe have time so for some extra questions. But we have until six, I give, uh, I want to ask Jippe, what are your main uh, key teams, your main learnings from uh, your breakout room? You're on mute, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really nice to uh, uh, hear the other group's uh, theme because we had a completely different uh, kind of discussion. We talked a bit more about uh, the methodologies that are in use. Uh, so first we kind of reviewed uh, from each of the countries that we are all from, uh, what kind of methods there are to safeguard the milk biotope. And Alisa had a really nice um, explanation about how she used, instead of the more uh, quantitative methods that we saw earlier in Steve's talk, uh, but how she used a qualitative approach to safeguard uh, uh, an American mill or the biotope of an American mill. Um, that was very successful, but uh, completely there was no uh, talking about um, the more uh, quantitative approach on, on the, wind, the wind models and the, well, the way to approach it like that. Um, we talked a bit more about how, for example, the international network uh, can also play a role in making an international standard. Uh, so that's also, we in inventoried all these different methodologies that are in use. Uh, and then we kind of concluded that the international network has a really big role in um, seeing to that all these methods are combined and that there is some sort of international standard between several of our countries. Uh, and I... Uh, Hannah also told us that uh, the steering group is also already talking about this. So that was also, maybe that's a secret, but um, well. 
Um, so when we have all these methodologies, of course, there are results that uh, come from them, but uh, these results can be quite uh, difficult to interpret for planners. Uh, so one of the other issues that we talked about was how can we simplify these uh, the results from, for example, a, a, a computer model or also a qualitative story. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a couple of these examples. Um, of course, we from the Holland Samola are working uh, on mill passports. So these are a, a system that we are developing to um, put into one document all the different kind of uh, the value of the mill, but not only in material value, but also immaterial things like uh, stories that are um, connected to the mill, uh, but also the landscape part of it. Uh, for the landscape part of this, um, the mill passport, we work together with an archaeological company. They specialize in how um, a landscape is, um, how they describe a landscape and also the changes in the landscape. So uh, from there, we learn that it's really important that there is one standard by which you judge the landscape and you can describe it. Also in the Netherlands, we have a system um, that has been done by several provinces um, where they did a... Um, um, there's a map of the Netherlands with all the heights of all the objects. So you can make an analysis of everything around the mill uh, from a certain distance. And you can kind of make a, well, this is a bit more quantit uh, quantitative. So you can see, oh, the, the objects uh, have gotten higher over the years. Uh, so these are also methods that you can simplify the, um, uh, the results of these uh, biotope inventories. Um, well, we also had a little bit uh, of a discussion about how to compensate. Uh, if there is a big development, how can you determine the, the compensation that you uh, uh, want to get from the developer? Uh, but here, the well, the discussion was a bit, um, there were diff different approaches to it. Um, maybe Stephen can, uh, because I brought in, in the Netherlands, we have a, uh, the, the, a method that has been used in the past, the social cost benefit analysis. Uh, that has been also uh, applied to mills, but Stephen said, uh, "Well, this is for the that something that the planners themselves also use, so uh, you shouldn't use their own methods against them." But maybe Stephen can <laughs> talk a little bit more about his views on that. Yeah, that's well, it. I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Jeppe, and uh, well, very interesting. That's uh, the complete different topics come uh, come up in this uh, breakout room. Well then, already the trees. Uh, John already spoke something about uh, spoke about trees. But Eric, what was the spoken of in your breakout room? And please unmute. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Well, the most important uh, conclusion was that trees are growing taller, but buildings not. That concludes my uh, my presentation. No, 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 no. Joking. Joking. Um, one of the problems. Uh, we uh, discovered was that uh, uh, greenery is often planted just, yeah, it is there uh, and everybody likes it. So why complain? Um, and therefore, uh, uh, legally, um, uh, excessive greenery is very difficult to deal with. Uh, and uh, uh, if you want to do something about greenery uh, or trees above, uh, around your mill, then there is a dilemma because everybody loves the greenery, everybody loves the trees, and they also love the, the, the mill. So uh, that's, yeah, how do you deal with that? Um, the tendency or the, 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 um, the, the formula uh, the biotope formula has a very strong identification with buildings and not so much with trees. So how do you explain to, to, to all the people that you have a formula not only for buildings, but also for trees? We, as Miller, we really like to use a simple formula, much more simpler than Steve explain to us but if you uh, uh if you hire consultants the and they uh, uh and they uh, you, they have to pay you uh, a lot of, or you pay them a lot of money then uh, maybe the, the the more complex formula which explains everything and uh, uh taken into account all the factors 
Yeah, of course. Then you have to use the the, the formula that which is uh, very justified. And last but not least, be friends with your neighbors. Why there, uh, either it, it is a uh, uh, owner of a big garden with big trees or officials of the municipality, but um, they are your neighbors. Invite them every year, continuously, and give them coffee. Explain to them what uh, uh, what the trees they are, uh, uh, what the trees does for uh, for the mill. Um, uh, well, be friends with your neighbors. I think that's that's very important. Um, let me see if there is something else. If you speak to the officials of the municipality, ask for uh, a, a zoning plan. Ask for a environmental pl a plan around your mill. If it's not there, help them to uh, to to make it for for your for your mill. That's it. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Eric. Very concrete. Very good. Yes. Um, I also will ask uh, Stephen and Agnes for some major points. Uh, first, let's start with Steve. Uh, can you do it in three major points, five minutes, Steve, or to talk about where you've been? Because you've been in several workshops. So <laughs> I've been in all three <laughs> yeah. uh, and had lively discussions in all three, which is brilliant because it's not a topic which gets aired in this way. I think there probably ought to be an annual Moe and Biotope conference to see how we're getting on. Ah, good we idea. Should we should record all the planning results, successful or otherwise, <laughs> and how many people have persuaded their neighbours to thin their trees at the least, <laughs> etc. Um, just sort of round up a couple of points. My aim is to publish the spreadsheet. It is a simple calculation. I mean, it, it, it's about as simple as you get, but you have to do it many times because you've got to go all around 360. You've got to do it for summer and winter uh, and you have to measure all the obstacles. Now, somebody said use LIDAR and I will look into that because that could be a brilliant answer. Uh, otherwise, it's the most difficult part of operating a spreadsheet. But I am planning to publish it and publish notes about how to get windrows and things like that. So this is an ongoing story. Plus, obviously, we plan the further verifications with um, the Smart Moland project. Um, and one point that John just raised then and which comes up over and over again, wind blows uphill. It does not, like water, go straight line horizontal surface. It flows uphill. And so having a house down here and a mill up here, that house affects the mill exactly the same as if it were there. Mm -hmm. And loads, the planning office go to the mill, they say, I can't see any houses in the way. If I look out there, there's no houses, but you don't, you look down there and nobody understands that. It's the lack of education is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should, should make a, a small model with a with a ventilator and uh, <laughs> let's blow it up there so I can see it. Yeah, does need something like that. Actually, probably just put some wool on the houses and you would see it going up oh. up upstream. Oh, yes. That's actually a very good idea. Some of those yes. uh, silver I, paper or I something. I think I might try yeah. that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Steve. Then I will go to Agnes. Uh, can you? That, which important themes and learnings did you pick up? During yeah. your... I've been in two, uh, two breakout rooms. I haven't been uh, in the qualitative uh, uh, um, room, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I think. Um, yeah, in, in connection to um, the last words of, of uh, Stephen, um, what we see in the Netherlands is, is that um, most uh, planning uh, um, employees um do, doesn't know at all what, what they're talking about they 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 don't know uh, how how it works in the mill uh, how it works with the wind um how the buildings and the trees affect it so um that 
th there is a lot to gain uh, to to uh, um, yeah to make them understand uh, that. Um, in in a few uh, weeks, we uh, also have a conf conference with uh, where a lot of uh, that people are uh, uh, present. So I hope we can can uh, bring some uh, knowledge uh, to them. So if we uh, do this every year, maybe have we have to also to invite um, uh, another group of uh, of people because we um, understand each other, I think. Um, I'm very interested in the qualitative uh, approach uh, Jip uh, told, uh, told about um, because um, I think that's very in, in, interesting. Um, but you, but yeah, I, I think it's impossible without the, 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 the quantities because um, uh, lots of, of, of planners and, and uh, builders they are uh, they, they are very black and white. So the, on, 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 on a certain moment, they want to know, is it yes or is it no? And then, then they want to have a number. It's, it's difficult to do it only with, with the uh, qualitative approach, but I'm very interested in it. I think it depends a lot on um, if, if, uh, if there is a good will uh, at, at, the other, at the other side, and then, then you can approach a lot. Uh, you can um, reach a lot uh, with uh, with that it with with that uh, that approach. Um, um, an international standard would would also be 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 nice. But um, I I also heard uh, we have uh, very different regulations in all the countries. So that's that's uh, maybe a big big step to to reach. But. Uh, uh, um, any way we can uh, uh, learn for, for, from each other uh, at how, how you use it in uh, in the other other countries is that, uh, that 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 will be still will be important but uh, um, if we, if we can reach one one standard yeah it's uh, it's nice but also very difficult I think we we, we don't have it in the Netherlands so uh... <laughs> sometimes you have to aim high yeah <laughs> okay thank you Agnes. Um... Uh, I think we have some time for questions. If somebody has a question, please raise your hand with the I'll icon. I'll just make a, a comment there. Oh, yeah, we, of course. We really should be aiming at the planning community and the architect community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I've been having discussions with a local architect about this very problem near to Slough and Prior, actually. And amongst other things, we've come up with a plan for possibly mitigating existing buildings. We want to build a bank and smooth off the airflow so that the effect of existing buildings is absolutely minimized. And, you know, if we could get a few discussions going like that, that would have a profound impact. Oh, good addition. I think... Not, we have still a lot to talk about this uh, the coming years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, not going to go away. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Are there any questions from the participants? Okay. I don't see. Yes. Okay. Simon, Alan. Yeah. Please uh, unmute yourself, then you can ask your question. I'm, 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 uh, Steve and I have had a, br a brief. Um, uh, communication last year uh, i'm from um the windmill at windmill hill in um yes. in and um where i've reached now is that i'm i'm starting to get some bits and pieces together to 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 work on uh the wind rows uh, for the mill but um i've realized how how crucial it is to have uh, current wind data uh, for the windmill and at the moment um basically I think we've got one weather station that actually is not working. And it, it's it, what I want to do is to do something much better. Um, I've spoken to Justin Coombs, who I think yeah. Steve knows. And what I want to do, um, what I want to do is I want to pre present a convincing case to the trustees of the windmill that getting some accurate wind data um, would really help because it will tell us what's going on at the moment. And as the development is built to the southwest, we can then look and see how things have changed. Uh, more importantly, and this may affect many of you, is that this windmill has had an awful lot of money spent on it. And nearly all of it has been grant funded uh, by National Heritage. 
and uh, we're very grateful to them. But one of the things that they wanted us to demonstrate is the community engagement. And it seems to me that having public available data on what the wind mill is doing and the wind and the direction and the strength and the length of the wind would be really useful. I'm really keen to try and uh, get to that point. That's why, that's why I'd like to end up so that I could actually, from my laptop, go to the windmill and see exactly what it was doing and look at past data as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's Simon, what... very yeah. interesting. You, you must get in on the Smart Molan project. Yes. Because we've just fitted an anemometer to mine, so you would get the pointing and the anemometry together, and that's what you need, and you need to do it urgently. Yeah, so I agree. Get on to we invite Stephen and Simon to take this one offline because it's a very specific yep. uh, focus on, uh, on a particular mill. Yep. What, what sort of cost is involved in installing one? I don't know the exact answer to that, but you're looking at about two to three hundred pounds, I think. Sounds very cost effective. Oh, it's it's trivial by comparison with anything else you would spend. OK. Any other questions for today? Uh, yes, Victor. Victor? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, I, I think all these Let's say these rules that we have now, and I think developing some new rules, and I know that Stephen is uh, very busy in doing that already, but yeah, talking to each other about that would be nice, I think, as a follow-up. So it's not about the trees or by the buildings, but more the, the theory behind yeah, calculating or helping the municipalities in deciding or something like that. I think uh, this will not be the last topic on uh, of, uh, conference on this topic. Yeah, Fred, Fred Hammond, you want to say something? Sorry, yeah. Fred. Uh, no, 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 no. I've already interjected. So, if I may, just come in on the point that Victor just made. Um, you know, one of the. Uh, possible options is that we even there I suggested to arrange a face to face conference uh, to uh, enable Steve to offer training on using the spreadsheet system that he has developed. Um, and yes, we are recognizing that, you know, international standards are very difficult to achieve. But uh, I think in my experience where one is able to demonstrate that a particular system is in use in other countries it adds significant weight to the argument for using it uh, at another location and one of the points as i say that we discussed that in the long term um, if each mill has a current windrose that uh, is enables a calculation of the uh, milling hours which are available then it offers a baseline and this comes back to hippers um, uh, comments about architecture, uh, landscape. There are multiple elements which we know we would want to be assessed in order to understand the heritage value of a particular mill. Does the mill work? Will the mill ever work? Uh, what about the other elements of the environment? These are the things that help us make sure that we can um, ensure the future of the mill is secure but also work with the many other people who want to uh, influence the environment of our mills. And um, this is a, a conversation, it's a dialogue um, and one that we have to come with evidence uh, and, uh, and good ideas. So perhaps if you're interested um, as part of the feedback for this session, we will ask you as to whether you would like to be uh, notified about a future conference um, and whether you would consider uh, you know, training to use uh, Steve's um, tool as we develop this with the other models um, which are available. I see Crystal uh, with her hand up. Yes, Crystal. Yes, Stephen, I have a question. We visited, I just remembered, we visited uh, Wilton Windmill um, last year. Is that part of the Smart Mowing project? I don't think so. Um... But it's smartmolen.com, isn't it? It's it's www.smartmolen.com. Yes, that's what it says in my picture. Yeah, and it's got it's got a list of all the mills that are currently 
live? I okay. think actually it is part of the Smart Roland trial. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Then I then I've seen it. <laughs> And so. we have installed um, wind tracking software uh, on uh, our mill um, and Which temperature, mill? whatever. Um, and uh, do you think that would help to take part in the smart mowing project? Can you Sorry. say something about it? I, I, I didn't quite follow that. Were you asking if it costs money? No, um, at uh, in on our windmill on the wings, and also uh, some some uh, a little bit farther away, we have uh, installed some wind trackers. My my son was in charge of that, ah. so I don't exactly know um, what they are doing. But uh, they also take humidity and and temperature and everything. Uh, because uh, would that be helpful for to take part in that project? Well, I think you need to talk to Simon, uh, to Justin, but um, I think the measurements have to be taken on the mill itself because normally private um, weather stations like that are simply not high enough to give you any idea of the real wind that you're getting. The anemometer needs to be mounted up the top of the mill. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and I think it needs to communicate with the system. So you have to have the right. It, uh, it, it needs to be wireless. Pieces. It needs to be wireless. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. You can't yeah. just use a generic wind meter or something. You have to use the smart molen stuff that they, ah, okay. they, they make, yeah. it, make it themselves and they connect. Then it connects to the Wi-Fi, and then it connects to the website smartmodel.com, and then you can uh, be part of it. Okay. okay. Some some mills in Germany are are also in it. Uh, yeah, there's four mills in Germany. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. You, you have to uh, check out with your colleagues, maybe. Um, so yeah. conscious of where we are in terms of time, I'm afraid that we did uh, say that we will be completing our conference. So I'll hand back to Nicole. Okay, I I I visit the the website and then have a look. Yeah, contact okay. them. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Crystal. Thank you for your questions. Very good. Uh, thank you, John, and thank everybody who's joined the conference. I thought it was very interesting, and I thought it was not the most easiest of all topics, but I think we did good, and it is a. One step of many more conferences on this topic, I, I already said. Well, thank you for joining. Thank uh, John and the other people from the steering group uh, and the moderators for their time and their assistance. And I hope we'll see you next time. This uh, conference will be on the website later on, so you can look at it again or share it with people who have not been able to join this conference, but the recording will be on the website. Okay. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.